Hello, Elena. Hello, hi. Good to have you here, Dr. Elena. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's also a pleasure to, to be on your podcast. Yeah, you are so welcome. There's so much that I want to learn about you. Shout out to Clubhouse. You know, we were able to connect uh, last week in an amazing room. And this is why I love Clubhouse, that you can meet people for the first time and still connect because there is a relationship that was built of trust, knowing somebody, liking somebody's personality and being a vocal influence. Yes, absolutely. I also love uh, the clubhouse and all the new relationships. And in a couple of months, I got to know so many people from all over the world. So I, I really love this space. Yeah, you're most welcome. Now, I'm sure people are also wondering, okay, there's much that we need to cover. I want people to know more about you, what you do, because you have amazing records, amazing statistics, and I would love our audience to know more about you in depth. Well, um, I am a communication coach and I'm working with uh, people in business on their communication skills, on their presentations, helping them to speak with impact, to structure their presentations so that they can be confident and impactful. And uh, I'm also working with students, so uh, with younger audience. I'm teaching at the University of Economics in Warsaw and uh, I'm uh, teaching about entrepreneurship and communication in business. So those are my topics and I am also organizing TEDx conferences in uh, Poland for the last about seven years. Wow. Wow. Congratulations. That's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So in terms of public speaking and communication, I would definitely want to ask you some questions. And the first one would be, what is the main element that somebody should think about when they're about to go to a platform, whether it's audio, video, visual, you know, graphics? What do they have to look for when they're communicating something to the next person? Yeah, so I think that... Uh, it is, uh, it is a very good question because we really need to start not from the presentation, the communication uh, itself. Very often we do this. We think, okay, so what am I going to say? What am I going to publish? And uh, we need to start from our audience. And this is what I'm always teaching when I'm working with my clients. I'm telling before you plan your presentation, think who is your audience and meaning not only their age and, and you know, demographics, but also think um, about their psychographics. What do they want? Or whom do they aspire to be? What are their dreams and desires? What are they afraid of? And only then, when you get to know your audience a little bit better, then you, it will be so much easier for you to craft your main message. And after you know your audience, you need to know what is your main message. Because I think that this is a big mistake that many people make, that they don't know themselves what is their main idea, or main message. Very often when I'm asking my clients, what what is... What is this that you want to say in one sentence? If you were to limit everything that you're going to say once to one sentence, people really have hard time uh, thinking about this. And they, they, they need a couple of minutes to think, okay, so what, what is my message? What, what is this that I'm going to say? Yeah. So I think that those two things, knowing your audience really well, and also being able to to say everything that you want to say in just one in one sentence okay that's a good one and it's more like an elevator pitch correct yeah um i mean uh, you can limit er each type of communication to one single message whether it is an elevator pitch whether it is a ted talk or whether it is longer uh, lecture or 
you know, depending on depending on the style of presentation, but no matter what uh, your communication is, how long it is, you need to be able yourself to say in one sentence, what is my main message? For example, I want to inspire people to make change in their lives in, or in their business, to start their business or to to do something. So we need to know what what's, why are we here and only then we can start planning the presentation. I like that. Once you're able to plan, then you have a strategy at hand. You know, that that's a main point that you've mentioned. And I like that because most people don't think about the planning. They just think about the doing and they get stuck. So how does someone that has gone too far <laughs> to, to, you know, retract their steps and say that, okay, I need a strategy, I need a design, I need a, a branding statement. How do they get from that unstuck method, from that stuck method to the unstuck method? Yeah, so uh, you can always, you know, come back to the beginning and start uh, start planning your communication from the beginning. If you are speaking about uh, brand communication, yeah, business communication, because you mentioned uh, what is... Uh, what is kind of my uh, brand, what, uh, what are my values. And uh, the, it is very often that we start doing something, for example, we start a podcast or we start a business, but we don't know what our kind of brand story. And it doesn't mean that we need to go back and to start all over again. Yeah, I think that this is in terms of business, in terms of doing things, it is the best strategy. Just start doing and then figure out your story and everything on the way. And in terms of business, I think that what can help is speaking with your target audience. Because when we are preparing our presentations, then we cannot we can also contact a couple. This is actually a strategy of some of the keynote speakers contacting several uh, members of the conference and, and asking them, reaching out to people who are planning to, to be at the conference and asking them, so what are you expecting to get from my keynote speech? Yeah. And uh, in business environment, it does not work like this. So you cannot uh, reach out to your I know, board of directors or your team if you're having a business presentation or your clients and ask, okay, so what do you want to hear from me? So it is a little bit more tricky. We need to analyze uh, the audience and what do they want. But in business communication, meaning in your uh, st business storytelling, what you mentioned, we can reach out to our potential customers or listeners to our podcast, uh, if, if you're having a podcast or um, someone who you would you think would be an ideal client for you and would buy your service or product and ask them, so what, uh, what would you like to hear? What would you be interested in listening to? Which guests would you like to have in my podcast? This is actually what I did yesterday on my Instagram. I just posted a request that if let me know what do you want to hear on my podcast because I have a podcast which is called Ideas and Leaders and I've been inviting uh, some business leaders there for some time but I think that my listeners they also know interesting people mm. why can't they recommend uh, recommend it uh, someone to me. So I think that the most effective communication is the one that goes both sides, not yeah. only us telling something, but also receiving feedback and using this feedback. That's a good point. That's a very good delivery strategy because it even made me think about the next question where when you think about delivering messages, people are either visual or they're auditory or they're kinetic. You know, people like to use their hands or they like to see things, beautiful colors. So when you're trying to create that developing strategy for someone who's getting in contact with you for the first time, 
how do you make sure that your message is clear on any of those three options? Yeah, I think that you need, uh, and and, uh, you're totally right here that people are different and we need to think about all of them. We need to kind of be uh, inclusive in and use, first of all, use different ways of, if we're speaking about business communication right now, we can, we should use different ways of delivering our message. In social media, some people love Instagram, some people love LinkedIn, some people are tweeting all the time and we need to be in different places because people are different and uh, we need to be everywhere. When we are thinking in terms of uh, delivering presentation, it is the same. So we need to, on one hand, for, for visual people, we need to prepare slides or some visual aids to show them something interesting. Yeah. Uh, in uh, best TED talks, uh, people are using some visual aids all the time. They're showing, I remember one TED talk was very famous because there was a brain on stage because uh, the, the speaker was telling something about how brain works. Yeah. And she was actually holding the brain. And, <laughs> you know, my visual mind <laughs> immediately uh, put it somewhere in my memory. So every time when I think about uh, great TED Talks, this comes up in my mind. So this is for visuals, for uh, people who are more, you know, uh, listening, uh, then we need to craft our stories in such a way. Also for those who are kinetic, we need to craft our stories in such a way so that they can feel, uh, they can, you know, almost touch. Because if you are uh, really rich in in this, in uh, stories and in explanations and you go deeper into the story not just describe what happened but describe where it happened how what was the smell what was the sound and go as deep to the story as possible then you can be sure that you will influence everyone in the room because some people will most likely imagine the smells while others will imagine the sound others will imagine the color and i think that stories are a universal tool with which you can influence everyone i love that i love the fact that you can bring everything together into one piece and still remember even though it was maybe 30 minutes but you took home one thing that is the greatest asset that you can deliver as a speaker yes for sure. I definitely agree too. And even for your for your background and how you've been able to gain this amassed experience and value, are you able to tell us more about your background? If we could just piggyback, like we say on Clubhouse, <laughs> are you able to tell us a little bit about your story and how you got to this point? Because I'm very, very much interested to know how you've been able to create this amount of experience and influential value to people. Well, uh, of course, it did not happen overnight, <laughs> and uh, I went through, you know, a journey of step by step getting uh, where I am right now. I think that I'm still on my journey, <laughs> and I'm moving forward. But I think that what was the kind of breakthrough moment for me uh, was when I decided to. Mm, Uh, to start PhD studies at the university and I realized that it was connected with teaching because I was thinking about you know writing PhD thesis and reading and uh, I'm actually an introvert so I I never was like all about people and communication and the moment when I realized that I have to teach, I was like, oh, no one ever taught me how to teach, how to speak to people. And it was so hard to me, especially that uh, I had to teach in Polish 
uh, because I was at uh, PhD studies in Poland and Polish is not my first language because originally I am from Russia uh, and I moved to Poland after some time knowing Russian and English and I learned Polish is my third language so imagine that I have to teach a group of people in my third language wow I was terrified I like I, I will not go to make it this is what I was thinking but mm, I started I think that this this breakthrough moment you know I managed I did not die <laughs> and <laughs> I, I think that this moment just gave me this understanding how important it is that we practice and we learn public speaking we learn communication from a very early age and that's why I did many things so I was engaged with Toastmasters International uh, with uh, different clubs to practice public speaking I did a trainer certification with uh, Dale Carnegie training to get trained on, on how to deliver trainings and uh, uh, on public speaking on leadership and uh, I started doing some trainings workshops speaking at the conferences you know for, in the beginning smaller than, than the, the bigger scale and I think that step by step I was going out of my comfort zone uh, one step at a time and then I found myself in such a place that if someone is inviting me to speak on a podcast, for example, or a, a big conference, live or online, I'm not feeling that it is something uncomfortable. I want to do this. I want to share yeah. what I know. And I, I would love everyone to have this feeling because this is an amazing feeling. I think that this is a feeling of freedom. <clears throat> when, yeah you are not limited by your fears that I know that many people still have those fears of public speaking and this is what I'm working on this is why I'm doing what I'm doing I'm working with people who have fear of public speaking who have some inner blocks in communication and I'm helping them to release those blocks to find this authentic speaking style and also as a TEDx organizer I'm also helping people to uh, become TEDx speakers and to get on TEDx stage. That's amazing. I love the story because it started off with a challenge and now you're rewarded with benefits because you've been able to pass the test, you know? Yes, yes, for sure. There were many tests and I think that every uh, step forward uh, is uh, every, every moment of going out of your comfort zone is uh, one step forward so this is what i'm definitely recommending to everyone if you have a kind of a challenge doing something new then just do it go out of your comfort zone and uh, it will give you benefits for sure exactly i love the fact that you mentioned that you know it builds that resilience in you especially when you meet new people because People still say that they have stage fright even after a hundred shows. <laughs> so you wonder, what's the difference between the, the first person to do a show and the same person that probably did it 10 times? What is that feeling? Is it the same feeling of doubt about the audience or is it that self-confidence that makes you pass those butterflies? I think that the feeling is the same, meaning physical feeling yeah that you feel that your heart is beating that you know dry mouth or uh, your hands are shaking so this is a typical reaction of our body to stress and we cannot 100 percent overcome it we can decrease it of course but uh, we still feel this excitement we feel this stress the difference is that uh, people treat this stress differently yeah when they are not confident they say oh i'm stressed i feel i feel that i can't breathe uh, and they start you know panicking and they uh, start overthinking and uh, thinking oh they will not like me they will see my shaking hands and 
all of those thoughts are going uh, in, in our mind, they are uh, like blocking us. And of course, we are, uh, we, it is hard to succeed with such mind blocks. Yeah. But uh, when you have uh, this confidence, and oh, it, you can gain it only with practice, uh, and of course with working with uh, with people who will give you feedback. This is what I really recommend to find your coach, to find your tribe, to find someone who will give you feedback over and over again. One of the great methods is having your podcast, by the way, because yes. you can record yourself and then listen. Uh, do you like your voice? What can you improve? How can you tell it a little bit differently so that it sounds better? This is this is also a great exercise, recording yourself and giving yourself feedback. So when you get this confidence step by step, then you have the same feeling uh, but you treat it differently. You feel those butterflies and you say, okay, I feel that I'm nervous. It means that I have this nervous energy. It means that I'm going out on the stage now or virtual stage and now I'm about to speak. And this is just, we know that it is there, but still we are doing what we are doing uh, with with this fear. Exactly. I love the fact that it's such a it's such a practice perfection practice <laughs> that when you think about doing it every day, it becomes normal. Just like you wake up, you brush your teeth, you know, you do your hair, you eat some breakfast, you go home, you know, after work. You, it's a practice because if you never learned how to do it, then you will never know how to do it. Yes, absolutely. And I think that public speaking, communication is a skill just like any other skill. Yeah. You know, if you want to learn how to play football, for example, then you cannot just go out and start playing, you know, with the, with the best players. No, you need to first, you know, learn basics, how to do this, how to do this step by step. Then you're starting to play with uh, someone who is less experienced, then someone who is more experienced, and then step by step. And then again, if you don't play for some time, then you forget and you need to start all over again. So as with any other skill that you have, that you can have, public speaking needs and, and communication needs to be practiced. And it's either uh, you need to have a coach, who who can help you with this or have a support group like Toastmasters, for example, where you will spend certain time, if you have time, of course, because then you would have to spend certain time every week or every two weeks on the meetings, then give and receive feedback. The You know, the choice is yours, but I think that it is impo impossible to learn this skill from a book or from a podcast. Yeah. that you you listen to the podcast and then oh elena is saying such wonderful things i think that now i know how to speak and i will go and be an international speaker <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't work like this uh, unfortunately you need to practice yourself speak get f feedback listen to yourself give yourself evaluation and feedback and this is a never-ending story and even for me I am coaching people currently, I'm a communication coach, but I still, every time I get to ask for feedback, I'm asking for feedback. If I get to listen to myself, uh, for example, my podcast episodes, then I'm always listening, okay, so how could I tell it differently in a better way, in a more effective way? So it is never, it is a never ending story. I love that. It's it's the beauty of actually trusting the process that makes it even more exciting because you may never know everything, but the more you know, the more you don't know. That's what a wise man said, <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And when it comes to even performance, when it comes to vocal performance, what would you say, especially within the TEDx regions that people focus on when it comes to vocal dynamics 
especially when you're emphasizing a point and when you're being more laxative? Yeah, I think that uh, the bigger the presentation, the more important it is to actually pay attention to your voice variety and kind of punching certain words and certain phrases. So this is something that you can uh, for sure prepare. It, you can, of course, you can uh, do it naturally, yeah. just being by being more expressive, by being more energetic. And when I'm working with speakers who are calm speakers, you know, there's this type, there's this type of uh, speakers who are speaking slowly and uh, very calm voice. They don't want to raise their voice. It is even hard for them. So when I'm working on a, on a voice with them, what I'm trying to do is to just raise the level of energy. Because when you go to the next level of enthusiasm in your speech, in your voice, then those accents and those punches, they will appear immediately. Uh, because when we're speaking in a very calm manner, unfortunately it is hard. And uh, those online meetings, they don't help because when we're sitting, uh, when we are not moving around, we, we are not standing, our voice is a little bit blocked. Mm. So even when I'm speaking on Clubhouse sometimes and I'm, I'm saying something, I prefer walking around and uh, having phone in my hand because then I feel that I, I can speak with my whole energy, with my whole body. Mm. And uh, sitting uh, on, on the Zoom meetings that we often do now, it does not help. So we need to get a little bit of more energy out, maybe even exaggerate a little bit. This is what I'm recommending. If you feel that it is uncomfortable for you to speak louder or to play with your voice a little bit, you can exaggerate and record yourself. When you're alone in your room, uh, press record. You can even record your voice without video if you don't want to see your, yourself on video. and. Try to exaggerate. Imagine that you are, you know, stand up, uh, the comedian, that you are an actor, that you just go, you know, wild. No one will hear you. Yeah. And then listen to yourself and see what can you adopt, which elements can you take out of this wild performance and you can incorporate them into your speech. I think that this exercise can help you a lot with uh, this voice uh, voice variety. I like that. When you're more confident and when you stand up, your vibrations even are higher because you feel like you're actually being more in control of your space and your speech than you are when you sit back and you're you're seated back, you're relaxed, you know, no, nothing is moving, <laughs> you know, you're just by yourself. But the whole essence of vocal approach is to be very audible and to be very clear message oriented, I believe. Yes, yes, for sure. We need to make sure that we are message oriented especially for the fast speakers there are there, there is this type of speakers and uh, i'm sure that people can recognize themselves in those you know types of course this is uh, those are very uh, you know white let's say uh, types but there is this type of, of people who are speaking very fast and they very often lose their point. So you start to say, speaking about something else and then something else, and then you remember that there is an additional story, then you lose track and start speaking about something else. So this is what we want to avoid. And we need to be focused on our message for sure. So when you're preparing your communication, even if it is a mini presentation on Clubhouse where you have to say something for just one minute, this is also a presentation. And if you think of a main point, what do you want to speak about? And then think of 
supporting facts or arguments that you can use to support this main message. For example, I will mention the statistic, then I will tell a short story about myself, and then I will uh, tell an interesting analogy or metaphor, and then I will go to my main point. Mm. So kind of having this structure in mind that you have two or three main points to cover, then it will be much easier to you not to get lost in your messaging. Wow. I, lo I love that four strategy method because now it brings more value to the conversation than just you talking about yourself. Because when you read a blog, when you read a video, when you read a video transcript or when you're even watching something, you're trying to get something from it. Even though the person that you're watching has value, you want to know what you can take from that discussion, whether you're there in person or whether you're there in a virtual presence. There's always something that adds value. So we're talking about public speaking and communication, and those two are directly what happens on Clubhouse every day. You're publicly speaking to people you don't know, and you're communicating something to people that need it. So how do you connect those two from an auditory perspective and still retain value if you have, like you said, if you have 60 seconds to make this point, how do you capture the audience? Because some people leave, some people drop off, some people have no clue what's going on. So how do you get all these people together so you don't lose anybody? Yeah, I think that Clubhouse is a bit different because it is hard to analyze your audience. Yes. And uh, you cannot say who's in, who's in your audience. I remember I was in one room, I was connected with business and marketing, and then I, uh, I don't remember, I asked some question about business, and then the person who was one of the moderators started telling me about high-end products uh, to sell some coaching programs for $15,000. And I was like, maybe I'm not at this level. <laughs> so he was speaking from his level. Because yeah. From him, he said, okay, you can sell like 10 or 15 such programs. And then, and uh, I was thinking that this is so hard to you know, from one question, from one minute, uh, figure out what this person actually wants. Yeah. And everyone who is there, they are mostly focused on, on themselves and not only on Clubhouse, everywhere. So the person, for example, from the point of view of uh, high-end products who is selling uh, huge programs and, and very expensive, they think that everyone is like them. And they would give advice on the, you know, on the same uh, level of understanding. Yeah. And if someone is in the, uh, network marketing business, then they only speak about this. So I think that it is very important to kind of know where, where in which club are you, in which room are you in, in Clubhouse. But still, even if you know, you don't know who is this person because anyone can go in. So I think that Clubhouse in this sense makes it much harder to f actually prepare our messaging. But I think that Clubhouse, on, on the other hand, is a great tool to practice your impromptu speaking skills. Yes. Because when someone is entering my room, I'm having rooms on communication, on public speaking, on getting uh, on TEDx stage. So questions can be about everything. And I have no idea what the person is going to ask. So I'm kind of ready for, for everything. And sometimes the questions are outside the box completely, uh, you know, not from not from my topic and you need to kind of improvise yeah. to lead the conversation all the time. So I think that in terms of prepared message, then it is really hard. But in terms of impromptu speaking, this is the place to be in order to practice this. I like that. And you also mentioned about 
impromptu and also being dynamic with your processing where if you have a club or if you have a room and you know that this is a topic of discussion and you've done your research then you know that whoever is coming into the room that may not know about those statistics can be helped and what people are also doing now is that once they're done with the room they go to a show notes section of their website and they're able to put information there so that people can catch on in case they missed it so when you think about the dynamics of people reaching out to you, because I know like you, you'd answer their question, they'll be so excited, and then they now DM you. When they do that, does it go further than that, or do their answers get um, their questions get answered on stage? Because sometimes they may feel like they don't know yet, or they may just feel like, okay, I need more, more, more. How does that work when you think about communicating with someone so that they can meet their need? Well, I think that everyone should have uh, a kind of their own systems. Yeah. Uh, for example, I have um, some uh, free downloads for people who are interested to get more information from me. Yeah. I have a download uh, for aspiring TEDx speakers, how to get to a TEDx stage. If someone is asking me more questions, then I'm sending it to them. If someone is interested more in communication, then I have a download uh, 10 strategies for effective communication online nice then i'm sending it to them and uh, if this person is getting interested in uh, my uh, information even more and they want to reach out and they want to schedule a call then we are having a short call uh 15 up to 15 minutes where i'm just presenting how can i support people because of course Clubhouse is a platform where we can answer some questions, but we cannot give, you know, full coaching, uh, uh, coach someone for an hour or several hours. This is just impossible. So then I am having discovery calls with people who want to uh, sign up for my coaching. And now I already have a couple of people who are interested in working with me. So I think that it, depending on what is our goal, what yeah. we want to achieve, we can kind of plan our systems, uh, how to, how people can contact us for sure. I'm not encouraging uh, to uh, get, get, to get getting lost in, in this clubhouse conversation because I can see that many people who are just entering this uh, uh, online clubhouse world yeah they are just there all the time you know from morning to evening all rooms they are there and I think that we need to set certain boundaries yeah that okay I have one room uh, now on Thursday uh, one room on Friday and then I'm guest into other rooms during the the week, and that's it. So it is uh, it is not turned on all the time. Exactly, and, and that's a very good point you mentioned because when you have an overload, and that's what happens in Clubhouse, when you have an overload of information and you can't process it after, it gets stuck. And then you can be able to go further because you need somebody to push you. And that's where we come in as coaches and mentors and advisors. So somebody who is starting off and they have a brand, how do they use social media to reach out to the people that need them? Because you can start anywhere, but there are some places that when you start, you know that you're going to get your return on your investment. It doesn't have to be money. It could be time. It could be value. It could be resources. But how does somebody get to that audience so that they are not missing their target? I think that if you're just starting, then I recommend to focus on two or three uh places where where you will be at but you'll be there constantly yeah for example having a podcast for example having regular posts on your instagram and having a weekly room on clubhouse so just set yourself the, the time in your calendar that you will be there regularly that you will post regularly 
and then just do it because uh, I think that what what I can observe is that many people in the beginning when they start they want to be everywhere and they want to do this and that and they they are super active then they're feeling completely burned out yeah. because they don't they don't see the effects and this is absolutely norm, normal we cannot have effects immediately this is long process we need to, to build uh, the brand to build the following and after people feel this burnout they stop posting they yeah. stop doing podcast episodes they stop uh, uh, with the clubhouse and this is i think is a mistake because build, building a brand needs this consistency so whether you're posting once a week twice a week but just commit to it that you're doing it which what are you posting and uh, no, not don't try to be everywhere but try to be at least in a few places but consistently exactly i love the word you mentioned consistency because without consistency there's no content delivery and there's no conversion at all yeah absolutely. <laughs> yeah okay okay I'm, I'm also learning a lot today because i'm really taking in on what you've said about being on platforms that help you scale and not being everywhere because if you're in more places you have more responsibility and that demands more time and if you don't have it then you're doing yourself a disservice when people are searching for you and they can't find what they're looking for when you call yourself an expert. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I'm, I can confess that I also was not, for a long time, I was not super active on Twitter. I was not super active on LinkedIn. Uh, but this is just because I was focusing on my Instagram on my Facebook, I'm doing Facebook lives every week. And this is what I'm doing consistently uh, every week, every Wednesday, no matter what, I'm on Facebook. And even if I'm not in my studio, I can be, you know, anywhere else, but I will do this from my phone. I need to show up for people who are there for me and who are expecting me to be there. And I was a couple of times contacted by people who I see for the first time. So maybe they participated in one of my workshops, free workshops, but I'd never worked with them. Uh, and they're saying, oh, I'm uh, listening to your lives weekly. They're great. And so if you are doing this every week, in the beginning when I started doing lives, no one said that they are my lives. <laughs> there were not so many people there. But now I'm getting regularly the messages that someone is, was listening to my life, that uh, they love what I'm doing, they love that I do it regularly. So people get used to it after some time. And uh, after some time, they even expect that you will show up. So yeah. they, it's okay, it's Wednesday. Uh, it's 7.30 p.m. Uh, in Europe, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, then they, they, they are there on Facebook and they, they are waiting for me, so I cannot, I cannot uh, just let them down. And this is how it works, that's why we need to choose our platforms wisely. Yes, I definitely agree on that. And if somebody wants to know how they can find you and how they can connect with you. What are the platforms that you would recommend them to connect with you on? So I'm inviting you to my Facebook where I have the weekly lives to my Instagram where I'm sharing also a lot of value and promoting my current uh, offers. And of course, I'm inviting you to Clubhouse. We were speaking about Clubhouse a lot and I have rooms every Thursday and every Friday. You can join my rooms on communication, public speaking and TEDx. And of course, you're welcome to contact me on any of the platforms. Amazing. What's, this, what's the social media handle they should look out for so that when they see your name, they know it's you? 
Yes, yeah, so it is uh, Dr. Elena Paweta, and uh, I think that on Facebook and on Instagram, uh, I'm uh, I'm going by this name, and I can send you the links to my social media also, so that you can you know put it under the episode. Yes, most definitely. Wow, this this is amazing. If I'm I'm so honored to have you here today especially you know at this time i didn't know it was night time so I, I really really appreciate your time here and if there's anything that you want to leave behind on this podcast and let people know about themselves what's the number one thing that they should focus on so that they can have a strong public speaking presence I think that the the main thing that uh, you need to focus on is to find your own way how you will practice Mm. because the practice is the only thing that will help you if you want to improve public speaking skills. So whether you will do Facebook lives, whether you will do your podcast or you will speak on Clubhouse or you will join a coaching program, you will join Toastmasters. There are lots of ways how you can improve your skills, but only listening to coaches and reading books will not help for sure. So practice, practice, practice. Exactly. Practice is the key to perfection. Wow. Thank you so much, Elena, for being here. You have been an amazing guest, and I'm so happy that we're able to connect. Thank you so much for inviting me. You're most welcome. Have a wonderful week. Yes, you too.